Hi everybody and welcome back to the Using Semiotics in Marketing read-along. It's uh, part three this time and we'll be looking at chapters seven to nine of the book. Some of my favourite chapters because all of them encourage you to do things with semiotics that you might not have thought of before or things that aren't usually talked about and all of them I hope are going to be useful for your um, evolving semiotics practice. But let's take a look at what's coming up this time. So as you know, if you've been, if you've managed to read along for this um, session today, then you'll know that uh, chapter seven um, is about doing semiotic field trips. This is such a fun thing to do. It's a topic that is rarely talked about in connection with semiotic research. Um, semiotics are often regarded as a form of desk research. And of course that certainly has its advantages. Um, <coughs> if you need to do research remotely because you're looking at a hard to reach culture or because there's a pandemic on and you don't want to go out and spread infection. But also where you can, where you have the opportunity, it's a great idea to get outdoors and do some semiotic observation, which is a little bit different from ethnography. And um, so I'm excited to uh, be able to share some of that with you today. While I'm talking about ethnography, um, chapter eight concerns how to combine semiotics with ethnography and also discourse analysis. Now these are three methods which work really well together because all of them are studying consumer culture. All of them take culture, which means human communication and the practical real world results of those communications as the primary object of study. And that's a bit different from our more traditional market research methods, which have focused very much on things like the um, interior psychology of the individual with all their um, attitudes and um, brand preferences and so on. And then chapter nine talks about how we get from data to insight and then to strategy. It's something that um, some uh, market researchers have struggled with a bit over the years is, um, you know, because we're interested in people, we've generally and historically been quite good at um, discover, finding out interesting things about them. But then turning that into marketing strategy has occasionally been somewhat of a stumbling block. And I think that semiotics kind of makes life a bit easier for us as researchers when we want to make recommendations to our clients. And so I'm gonna take the opportunity to talk a little bit about how to make that happen. If you've been reading through the chapters, of course, there's a bunch of activities that you will have been doing on the project that you may be working on as we go through this read along. The one I want to draw your attention to today in particular, if you only do one out of all three chapters of activities, make some strategic recommendations for your client, just have a practice. If you do it now before you actually need to do it, then you'll be in a better situation when you have a live project with some budget attached to it. Okay, so as you know by now, I like to um, start each of these sessions with just a small bit of business news. So here it is. So um, in various parts of the world, including um, here in the UK, I'm speaking to you from London, um, lockdown is starting to relax um, and what we're seeing is that um, so-called non-essential stores have started to reopen and um, some people are very anxious and feeling that it's too soon and uh, we should all be staying indoors for much longer and um, doing everything we possibly can to avoid a second wave of the pandemic other people feel that it's very important that we stimulate the economy and what we want really is for people to get out there and flex their credit cards and what's quite interesting is that a lot of people who are only too happy to do that only too excited to do that so there was a lot of online shopping while everybody was stuck indoors and now that the high street stores are beginning to open we're starting to see the return of high street shopping as well and i'm sure for all those people who were kind of worried about the decline of the british high street before the pandemic it must be a little bit heartwarming to see how much people have missed shopping in you know in the kind of physical world um, when the stores reopened here in london the first thing that happened was that a huge queue formed outside of um Nike's flagship store on uh, Oxford Street and the statistics that you see here refer to um, the UK in uh, May so last month um, and there's um, um, non other non-food such as clothing right in the middle went up by a massive 24 percent in terms of retail sales during May <coughs> there were when there were the queues outside of Nike were photographed people jokingly remarked that um, 
not all of the not all of those shoppers were wearing masks because they didn't need to because uh, everybody knows that a new pair of Nike trainers inoculates you against the virus. Whether that's true or not, I'm sure the clothing retailers are enormously relieved that they're finally shifting some product. The other thing that's enjoyed a massive kind of um, surge of profitability over the last um, month is homewares and DIYs. A lot of people spending time at home realised that it was about time they, they, or that they finally had an opportunity to get around to those um, annoying um, chores and repairs, home repairs and things like that, that had been sitting around for sometimes for years on end and they got on with it. So it's a great time as well for homewares and DIYs. Food is food sales are down, um, not because uh, people have um, stopped being interested in eating, but just because food um, purchasing has re now returned to normal levels after the panic buying that we saw in the early stages of the pandemic. And um, I think we have to regard that as a good thing as well, if only because it means that our supermarkets now are stocked at normal levels and we don't have people kind of panicking and buying up all the essentials that NHS workers then can't access. So all in all, pretty good news for, um, for retail and um, it'll be interesting to see how this unfolds. What I want you to do from a semiotic point of view is think about these items as semiotic signs, okay? So um, the, the home is quite a complex um, set of semiotic signs, um, which says something about not only the taste and um, demographic of the consumer, but also expresses um, their values, their emotions, the way that they care for things, what kinds of things they value, what kinds of things they treat as rubbish. So the interiors of people's homes is a very um, rich um, resource for semiologists and also for ethnographers, as you know. And then um, clothing as well, with this, as we've seen in this kind of joke about the Nike trainers inoculating you against coronavirus. Clothing, very much a clothing brand, especially branded clothing. Um, all, all branded clothing items are semiotic signs and in the case of the new new pair of Nike trainers actually it's a totem, it's an expression of hope it's, and it's a kind of talisman that the um, purchaser and the wearer hopes will restore pre-pandemic normality. So these are some of the ways in which we can apply semiotics to the news stories of the day. Right then, let's talk about what's in this book this week. So activities, um, there are in the, the chapters you've been reading, chapter seven to nine, as always, there are um, activities in each chapter and um, here they are. So um, if you're feeling brave, and there's no, absolutely no compulsion to do this, but if you're feeling brave and you actually there is something you actually need to go out and get, then go shopping and have a look at what people are doing and just take some notes. You might want to observe things like um, which shops have massive queues outside and which ones are empty, you know. Also, one thing that kind of really interested me a lot during lockdown was that in my local area, all the stores put up their own um, handmade signs explaining that they were closed and I was very interested to observe the linguistic differences between those things. So these are the kind of observational challenges that you might set yourself, okay. If you're staying indoors, that's very responsible of you to do that, then um, choose a product or a category that interests you and collect, go on Amazon and collect a bunch of reviews. And you will be able to apply techniques from discourse analysis, which we see in chapter eight of the book, to um, identify some different ways in which people um, will um, use um, linguistic tokens to argue for certain versions of reality, as we've seen um, throughout our study of semiotics, but also to um, anticipate and ward off criticism, to present themselves in certain ways, and to try to um, influence the, the way that other people see them. And then thirdly, um, perhaps the most important activity this week is about making strategic recommendations. And I'll come on to that shortly. But essentially, there has to come a point where we say, right, that's it. I've done enough analysis now. It's time now for me to be brave and give my clients some direction what they should do with their brand that's going to be relevant to the world that we live in today. What you need to do when you're working through these activities, doing your field trip, doing your discourse analysis, as ever, is really stay focused on your client's business objectives. I said this last time, I'm going to say it again this week. Staying focused on your client's business objectives throughout your project is the route to success. It's a bit like if any of you have done um, quantitative research 
or as a matter of fact, if you've ever supervised a student who is doing a quantitative project, it's a very common problem with students, very common mistake, rookies mistake that they make, is that they'll design their research project and they'll put together a survey or whatever, and they haven't thought about what, what statistics they were going to use to analyse their data. So they just go ahead and design a survey and collect a load of data and they wait until their data set's complete and then panic because it's not clear what kind of st statistics they should be doing. Okay, so th there's a similar situation um, applies here in semiotics. You know, if you if you if you lose track of your client's business objectives and just wander off down the kind of daffodil lane of interesting analysis, you may find it difficult to return. So a bit like the, the, the sensible quantitative researcher who designs his or her research right from the start, knowing what they're looking for. What are we doing here? Are we looking for a correlation? Are we doing a cluster analysis? If you stay focused on your client's business objectives, what is it they're trying to accomplish? Are they trying to change people's behavior? Are they trying to break into a new market? Are they trying to tackle some kind of um, social problem? Then you will, if you plan that into your analysis from the beginning, then you'll have a much easier time when you get to the back end. Okay, all right then, field trips. Let's talk about what kinds of things you can do on a field trip. One thing that um, you might like to do is to go out in your local neighbourhood and have a look at the um, at some urban architecture, which could be things like um, Broussard stores, it could be things like um, office buildings, um, petrol stations, um, parks, um, open air markets, um, municipal swimming pools, anything you can think of that's not a, actually a product of nature that's kind of made by humans and has been um, made into a built up into a built environment is avail available for you to semiotically analyze. And what I will say is you, you may be wondering or observing that this has a lot in common with ethnography. So what, what ethnography will do certainly will send you to interesting places like Skipton, which is a village in Yorkshire, which you see here, which are, it's a um, quite, it's quite a historic part of England that attracts a lot of tourism um, from within the UK and from other countries. So if you're doing, ethnography will commonly put you in, in situations like this. And I guess what we're doing most of the time, certainly in the commercial world of ethnography is where, um, we're observing and we're using a video camera there's going to be a big emphasis on things that move around so we'll be looking at people using the space milling about sitting in cafes forming queues and that type of stuff okay and in a sense what ethnography is good at is capturing the reality of things it's good at capturing the local reality of this village of Skipton what you're doing with semiotics is something slightly different rather than capturing or trying to capture reality itself what we're specifically interested in with semiotics is representations of reality and that's why I was very drawn to this um, Dale's Toffee Shop when I was in um, Yorkshire um, making this um, visit because what I can see is that there's a tension between reality and a representation of reality which exists largely for tourists. So the reality that we're looking at here is actually an owner-managed convenience store um, or as Brits would call it a news agent. So in this store you can buy um, things like um, House, simple household goods, canned food, bread, milk, tea bags, cigarettes, things that are regarded as being kind of essential to everyday British life. Okay, you can also buy sort of newspapers and things like that. So that's what's in the in the interior of the shop. So it's essentially a, a remarkable convenience store. The exterior of the store, however, presents a version of reality which is a kind of um, a rather lovely fictional story. Um, so we we have um, a shop here the ex in its exterior doing a kind of performance for the tourists. So that the, this whole region in Yorkshire invites it succeeds at tourism because it invites it's got some lovely buildings and, and landscape, and it invites the the visitor to imagine that they're sort of travelling backwards in time about two hundred years, um, which would have been a time when um, there was a thriving um, sheep farming and wool industry and um, I guess you know it's all quite exotic if you're a foreign tourist and it's easy to imagine you know people um, 
who look a bit like, you know, perhaps the Bronte sisters in um, in frocks with big skirts, kind of wafting about and maybe take, taking a trip down to Dale's toffee shop and all things to buy toffee and homemade fudge. It's really interesting stuff, you know, so you've got this sign on the outside of the wall, Dale's toffee shop, but it's really not clear what a toffee shop is, except as the sounds like something that Charles Dickens might have imagined, you know. It's just certainly is not a shop that um, is making its money from toffee. Toffee is not its main source of revenue. Um, then you might notice as well these kind of picture postcards outside the store, which um, f naturally feature all of the most beautiful and um, uh, iconic aspects of Yorkshire, the bits of Yorkshire which are part of the Yorkshire brand. And then we've also got this um, this lovely um, newspaper headline at the left here, New Maple for Grussings and Children, which is a subject that I talk about quite a bit in the book. So maples are um, part of a uh, very kind of um, historical sort of pagan version of England. And this newspaper headline as such is a very unusual thing. It's kind of deliberately historical. It's historical in a very mannered way. You know, we might observe all the other things it could have said but didn't say, like new car park erected in city centre, you know, or crime spree of burglary takes place in nearby Keighley. And so what we've got here is a number of things like the newspaper headline on the left, the sign outside the store, the idea of the toffee shop, these picture postcards which present Yorkshire at its most beautiful, its most historical, are all working together to prevent, present a certain version of reality in which we can almost literally step back into the Victorian era. These, just for contrast, I'm not going to talk about this one at length, just for contrast, this is another photo that I took myself in um, Irvine in California in a business park. If you think about it, the concept of a business park is itself a bit strange. It's certainly not a product of nature, is it? You know, it's a kind of, um, it's most definitely a product of um, civilization. And what I notice when I look at this photograph of the Price Waterhouse Cooper building is that um, if, you, if Skipton in Yorkshire is, is, is kind of enjoyably caught in a tension between the present moment and history, so the past and the present, then Irvine, this Irvine Business Park and the PricewaterhouseCoopers building is caught, enjoy, kind of enjoyably caught in a tension between nature and culture. So on the one hand, we've got this enormous slab of a building which is designed to be impressive, it's designed to be authoritative, it's designed to assert PwC's dominance and say, look at our wealth, look how powerful we are, and they do that very successfully. At the same time, all of those mirrored surfaces didn't get there by accident. That's a technique that's been used in recent years by architects who we think of as doing stuff that's broadly postmodern. And part of the reason for that is because it, 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 rather than just being a huge slab of a building, it actually reflects back some aspects of nature, like that big blue sky, um, the palm trees, which justify giving the business park its name, and so forth. So what we've got here on the one hand is this massive kind of a quite assertive monolith which is a product of human culture look what we made look what we achieved look at this big, big gilded palace that we built and then at the same time there's this constant um quite diligent referring back to the natural environment look at this look at the the blue sky look at the trees and let's be aware as well this is only a few miles away from the coastline this part of california has 42 miles of unspoiled coastline most of the people who work in this building will have limited opportunities to enjoy that coastline because Americans work very long hours. There's a culture of presenteeism. And so the, the, the more beautiful aspects of this business park are there to kind of compensate the workers and to bring some uh, something of the natural world into this, um, this um, almost um, cathedral to capitalism. So these are some of the things that you'll want to look at. And at the same time, while you're there, if you get a chance to talk to a few people then do that so what we're doing at this point is looking at a short extract from um chapter eight which concerns um ethnography and discourse analysis i'm not going to talk you through the the, the analysis of this short segment of conversation in detail just because you can read it in the book but um what i will do is point out a couple of things that discourse analysis will, will do for you that really um works well with semiotics and ethnography so we've got this consumer here um, 
in a conversation with me telling me about um, this place where they live and so um, what I would um, suggest is that this person is um, quite keen to make an impression on me they're quite keen to impress upon me that they've made the right choice in deciding where to live and they're um, achieving that in a bunch of different ways but the one I'm going to draw your attention to right now is on line three so here we have uh, I've already agreed with the consumer that it's a nice neighborhood so I've already conceded this point you know there's no argument but the consumer goes on to emphasize exactly what they mean by it's a nice neighborhood with these words I feel safe going out at night in my car I feel safe I know that my children are safe now, a discourse analyst will immediately recognise that as a three-part list, and there's lots of good quality um, 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 evidence and uh, publishing in discourse analysis that shows that when people, uh, when a speaker produces a three-part list, the audience will typically respond to that list as though it's a complete set of things. And in fact, that's what you see me doing there. I'm ready to agree with this with this person. What, what the discourse analyst will notice then is that this individual is very keen to tell me that it's a nice neighbourhood, very keen to convince me of that fact. Uh, and you might have thought that they would go on and say something like, I don't know, at least three different things maybe, or oh, I don't know, it's got nice scores, or there's a really great sports stadium nearby, or um, we, we've got a fantastic um, um, art museum down the road. But instead we get three different iterations of SAFE, that's how that's how strongly the consumer is emphasizing it and if you look if you read my analysis of this passage of, um, of talk in the book you'll see that i'm going to draw the conclusion that this massive emphasis on um safety is compensating for something what it's compensating for um is um the unspoken suggestion that actually this um property is um, too small to accommodate this person and his family in a socially acceptable way. It's an interesting conversation because he's skirting around a sensitive topic. I'm gonna, not going to go into it any more deeply than that for now, but there's a long discussion about this in um, the book to show you how to use discourse analysis with semiotics and ethnography. And I very much welcome questions about how to analyse this kind of text if you want to ask me in a few moments. These, this table just handily summarises a few of the difference, differences between ethnography, semiotics and discourse analysis. I mean, there's always more that one could say, honestly. I could write a whole book about how these, these methods are different from each other and what they've, what they've got in common. Um, but here's a handy table in case anybody asks you. Um, so, for example, uh, what are you doing with semiotics that's different from ethnography or different from discourse analysis? And from your benefit, knowing how these things are different will help you to do better and more complete analysis. If you are really clear in your mind about how ethnography is different from semiotics and how both of those things are different from discourse analysis, if you're clear in your mind about the unique contribution that each of those um, research methods is making to your project, then you're in a really good position to decide how much of each do you want. Do you want this to be a mainly semiotic project with a little bit of um, ethnography and DA sprinkled in? Is it mainly ethnography with a bit of semiotics? You can make informed decisions at this point and, um, and uh, essentially produce a better research project because you're more in control of the methods that you're using. And lastly, I'm just going to talk for a minute or two about um, data and how we turn data into insights and then into strategy. So if you've been doing your project with me as you've been working through this book, then at this point you've got quite a lot of data. Um, you may have the following kinds of things. You might have a lot of advertising and packaging. You might have a lot of screenshots of um, company websites. Um, you might have um, photographs, video clips, transcripts of people talking. You've got loads of stuff. The insights that you're looking for, and I think it, it's worth being precise about what insight means, the insights that you're looking for will cause some kind of change to arise. So they will cause you to look at something like your consumer or your client's um, category or your product in a new way. And when you've identified 
the um, potential for change, that's when you're in a, really in a position to make strategic recommendations. So I'm just going to do one example because I really am out of time now. Um, one quite nice example was um, identified by artists before it was identified by market researchers. And that insight was that people expect things to be a certain size. Okay. Um, so in just the same way that we have stereotypical expectations about what older people are like, for example, which are challenged by this photo here, we also have quite culturally embedded stereotypical um, expectations about what size things ought to be, what size should a sandwich be, how about an ice cream cone, how about a box of matches, um, how about a basketball. We've got clear ideas about how large or small these things are going to be. And one easy way that you can, uh, that's the insight, okay? The insight leads to change. That is, you can take any product, any brand, and you can um, blow it up to 40 times its normal size, or you can shrink it right down to a miniature. And why is that useful for clients strategically? Because it gets consumers' attention, that's why. Because there are a bunch of examples that show how if you take some everyday object and make it either huge or tiny, consumers will instantly sit up and pay attention. And there's, again, there's quite a detailed discussion in the, um, in the book of how to do this. And um, I even suggest some, um, some uh, uh, visual examples that you can look at as well. Okay, I've talked a lot this week and um, I think I'm going to stop there There's some giant sushi um, just to show you an example of um, how things can really be attention getting when you change the expected size. But right now I'm going to stop um, um, uh, uh, keeping up a sort of monologue and let's have a chat. Let's um, have a discussion about your project and uh, answer some questions. That's what we've got coming up next week. But right now, let's um, have a chat uh, between us all and with Ray and hear about your projects and what questions you'd like to ask me.